you have to stay within your chain of command. And I was like, ma'am, due respect. I'm a civilian. I don't have a chain of command. Hello, I'm General Alan Salisbury, host of CODA Supports Profiles in Service podcast. In this podcast series, we explore the many dimensions of service, service to the nation, service to our communities, and even service to humanity. Our guest today is Christina Kaufman. Now, full disclosure, uh, Christy and I are co-founders of the CODA Support Foundation, uh, but I believe that Christy has a unique path to service that uh, is worth exploring as part of this series. And Christy, welcome to Profiles in Service. Thank you, Alan. I want to explore your back early background and what got you started in uh, the road that, that you have traveled. I think it's quite an unexpected road, as most of us find that uh, life is what happens as you're making other plans. But let's start with your growing up. Uh, you're from a uh, upper middle class family, is that fair to say? Yep. In, uh, in the New York area. And you grew up in a, became a multiracial household. Uh, can you give us a little background on how that maybe impacted your thinking about life? Yeah, sure. I grew up in a family of four. Uh, my parents, Bill and Karen, uh, we lived in New Rochelle, New York. My sister is about 15 months older than I am. So they got the two girls out of the way quickly and uh, they really wanted boys. And so they uh, looked into adoption. I think originally um, they were looking the children coming over from the Vietnam War at the end of the war. Um, I, I don't think that, I, I guess I've never really asked them this question, but they just wanted boys. They didn't care. They knew that it would, you know, would be challenging, but um, they were certainly, you know, open to um, whatever boys they uh, found in their heart. And so they ended up working with a social worker, I think, here in the Washington, D.C. area, and um, they found my brother, Mark, and... Boy, he was born in 72, so uh, we adopted him, I think, 73-ish. Um, I think he was about eight months old. And then about a year and a half later, two years later, we adopted Terry. Um, I don't really remember very much. Maybe I was so young. I just, I can't really remember the family without them in it. So yeah, that was, you know, in the early to mid-70s, uh, being in a mixed-race family was still relatively unusual. Uh, it, it's much more common today, I think. But my parents, you know, they made um, an effort to kind of live in a multiracial neighborhood, which wasn't easy to find, you know, upper middle class multiracial uh, neighborhood at that time <clears throat> in New York. And aside from the fact that you know, we had a couple different colors in the family, it was relatively traditional upbringing. Dad was a banker, mom stayed at home. <clears throat> and um, as you mentioned, we were very blessed growing up and we all did sports. And, but I think we, we experienced, <clears throat> um, we all experienced racism, obviously, in a way that probably, at least for Kim and I, white kids wouldn't really necessarily see so up close um, because it's not in their family. I was actually kind of confused when I was really young going to sleepovers. I didn't understand that everybody in the family was one color. You just kind of think, families just like yours. So I was a little confused. I thought everybody had mixed race families. Uh, but I think that for us, what, what happened in terms of a family dynamic is we all, all the kids felt really um, able to navigate through different cultures and through different races. And uh, there was never really barriers there that, that might've been in a single race family, but it also made us closer as a family because we, we were kind of uncommon at that time. So I think it really did help, you know, in just terms of the strength of the family bond. But it was a pretty typical upbringing. Now, many people who know you, I guess <laughs> almost everyone who knows you, uh, would immediately identify you also uh, in the category of gymnast. Uh, when did you first get interested in gymnastics? It's probably the ponytail that I just never put down. I still look like a gymnast because of my ponytail. <laughs> um, I first started doing gymnastics when I was six. 
And that was because like a lot of kids, I was flipping around the house and breaking stuff. I, my sister and I, so my mom put us in a Saturday morning class, like at some community place. And that's how it started. And those that may be watching on video and not just listening to this as a podcast uh, may note that uh, Christy has the typical blonde ponytail uh, that is uh, de rigueur for any any gymnast. So you can take the gym, the girl out of the gym, but you can't take the gymnastics out of the that's, girl. That's I, true. I, and I, I am still known to do flips once in a while. But more seriously, uh, at some point, as you develop uh, as a gymnast, and I'm <laughs> speaking of very little knowledge, but uh, th you make a, a serious decision that you want to pursue gymnastics uh, very seriously with uh, ambitions maybe of, of competing on the national level and beyond. You made that decision. As, I'm sure it was a family decision. And yeah. How yeah. old were you when you made that? I mean, I was, I was um, 12, 13 years old. I was winning everything and I wasn't that good. I mean, I was good in my little area in New England at the level I was at, but then I would turn on the TV and watch the girls and I'm like, I'm not even close to that. So if I want to go to the Olympics or try, then I need to go to a place where there are people better than me um, and, and, uh, and train up to that. So that's what really prompted the decision um, that, that I made with the support of my family to, to move away from home when I was 14. I boarded with um, a house full of girls. It was run by parents of another girl that did gymnastics. It was a gym in Pennsylvania. Yeah, you're in New York. Where were, you, where were you going for this trip? Allentown, Pennsylvania. It was a gym called Parquets, which is still there today. At the time, it was uh, in the mid 80s. Um, there were only really three gyms producing Olympians. And that was one of them. The other two, one was in Texas and one was in California. I didn't want to go that far. How much time did you get to spend at home during that time? Oh, I mean, I, I would try to go home on the weekends when it wasn't competition season, but, you know, probably maybe once a month. And, and did you survive the lack of parental supervision or was there some level of, of parental supervision exercised by the school? Oh yeah. I mean, there, I mean, gymnasts, we don't need a lot of supervision. <laughs> like we're, we're really, I mean, everybody has their homework. But and, these are developing years as a young teenager. Yeah. I, so I, I would say that there was a couple of years there that my coaches definitely had more of an influence on me than my parents. My parents had three other kids to raise. Was that positive or negative? I think it was both. I think it was both. Um, back in those days, the coaching style was um, severe. Um, so it was very much in kind of the Russian Romanian model. And so it was tough. It, they, they were, you know, they had a lot of sway over, you know, 15, 16 year old girls. Um, and sometimes it wasn't, um, they weren't making the best choices. Now, I think they're all well-intended, uh, things are a little bit different today, but that's one of the reasons why I became so close with my teammates. Um, the girls that I moved uh, away with or the girls I was doing gymnastics with, I'm still friends to a, with a lot of them to this day. Now, at 14, this is about uh, eighth grade level, somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, how did your schooling develop from, from there? So uh, my parents were adamant that we wanted me to continue to go to public school. Uh, a lot of the girls uh, who, who trained, trained at Parkettes went to a Catholic school, even the Jewish girls because they would let them out early. Um, and they were just more flexible in the schooling. So I would just load up my classes in the beginning of the day and, you know, not have to go to gym, skip lunch and go right to the gym. So, you know, okay. I was still getting my A's and doing all that stuff. So you fairly reasonably had a typical high school education? Then, or? I would say a typical high school education, but not a typical social <laughs> like experience at all. I mean, I I didn't do anything except for go to classes and go to the gym and compete. All right. Well, you managed to get a high school diploma. <laughs> I, I did. Assume. Uh, and uh, how, what was your college search all about? Well, you know, when you're a highly recruited athlete, you get um, uh, recruiting trips and schools will pay for five of them. So I, this, <laughs> this was back in the time of Baywatch. And that's all I knew about California. And I'm like, dude, I'm going to California. So I, three of my trips I took, one was Stanford, one was UCLA, and one was Cal. 
Um, and and I ultimately decided to go to Cal. I thought it was just the best fit for but me. But the door to the school in all cases was through the gymnasium. Well, no, you still had to have, you know, you still actually had to have- Well, you had to be able to be qualified yeah. for, for admission, but- Exactly. Still, your, your primary interface was those that had gymnastics programs and wanted to recruit you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I, I, I did look at potentially, because I had a really bad injury um, my, right before my senior year, that's one of the reasons I moved home. And I, you know, I was pretty high at rank nationally in the top 30 and, um, and I was, you know, I had a shot at the Olympics, but then I ripped my hamstring. Uh, and that was kind of a deal breaker, right? I mean, it didn't quite end my career, but it certainly ended any hope I had of going to the Olympics. So then I ended up moving back my senior year, um, to, to the high school in New Rochelle, just to rehab and, and, you know, get back enough that I could still fulfill my scholarship. But that was actually a real, I mean, that's tough. You train something all your life and then you, you know, you get injured pretty badly and it ends that. So I think that that, that was tough to deal with at, at that young age, but it, I think it also taught me a lot, you know, about putting eggs in one basket. So. Yeah. Uh, I spent four years of graduate school at Stanford, uh, a few miles down the Bay uh, Peninsula. And uh, we, we viewed uh, Cal Berkeley as, of course, uh, a, a huge rival, uh, but also as a liberal bastion. I think you probably knew that going in. Uh, how did that culture affect you in, in your growth other than academically? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I didn't I wasn't from California, so I didn't know all the history of Berkeley and, and People's Park and all of that stuff that went on back in, you know, in your era. I knew it was liberal, but one of the things about Cal is it's also very diverse. And so there are plenty of conservatives at Cal. I actually really enjoyed being able to interact with lots of different type of people of different persuasions. And, and that was one of my favorite things about Cal. I didn't, at, at Stanford, I didn't feel that same kind of diversity of, um, of experience. Um, that's one of the reasons I went to Cal. I, I think that, you know, like most young people, I was relatively socially liberal um, and, you know, participated in some of the, the, the uh, marches and stuff that they had. But I also really knew nothing about the military at that point. I, I knew we had an ROTC because we're a land grant university, um, but uh, it was- What wasn't year did you graduate from Cal? 92. 92. Yeah, 92. So, um, so yeah, I, I, my, my experience at Berkeley, again, was very, was, was not as focused on gymnastics, but my friends were. Uh, so all my girlfriends that I went, like we all went in together as freshmen, we're still tight and, uh, um, so yeah. Now let's jump ahead uh, to uh, meeting your husband. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that happen? And uh, preview, he's a West Point graduate as am I, uh, and that's not exactly the most liberal bastion <laughs> on the planet. It is true. Uh, so I met Reese in 98, I think. Um, I had started a personal training business um, after I left Cal and, uh, and I was watching TV one night and it was when they first came out with those what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas commercials. And so I'm like, wow, I've never been to Vegas. I'm 29. I'm, I'm going. So I went on a whim and he was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base. He was army, but he was doing his joint time and met him the second night in the hotel. And, and then we started dating because obviously Las Vegas and Northern California aren't that far apart. And a year later got engaged and a year after that got married. But people always say, how did you meet? And it's the only place Berkeley and West Point could possibly meet, Vegas. So uh, from the California Bay Area uh, Peninsula, you rock it to where? Lawton, Oklahoma. Where the, the home of Fort, Fort Sill, Sill, the home of the artillery. Home of the artillery, yep. So Reese is an art, was an artillery officer and that's kind of the home of the artillery. And so when we were dating, he had told me that he had been stationed in Germany and Hawaii and Vegas. And I didn't know anything about the military. I'm like, all those places sound great, you know? And he was, I guess, maybe 15 years in at the time, 13 something. So I knew it wasn't gonna be, figured he'd get out at 20. And 
I'm like, this is going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting a social experiment. So you've had the personal experience of being uh, indoctrinated, I guess, into the way of life of the military family. Yeah, that was, um, I, I think that it would have been a culture shock just going from Berkeley to Lawton. And then you add the army on top of that and that culture. And then the war started three months after we got married. So that was a lot. Um, and I just, you know, one of the things I realized coming into the army um, family relatively late, I was 30, Reese was 35. He was already a major when I met him. Most of the people in the military get married younger, right? You know, early 20s or something like that. So they, they get enculturated into it. And so by the time, you know, their husbands or wives have been in for 10, 15 years, you know, they've kind of learned the ropes and the things, at least for you guys, all the rules are written down. For wives, there's just a lot of things that you're expected to know and do without ever anybody ever actually in telling. In my you. era, the, one of the most popular books on military installations was The Army Wife. Yep. Uh, and that was considered to be a full-time job. Yep. Uh, and uh, there were a lot of handbook types of uh, information in that. But of course, that was the uh, late 1950s and early 60s. Uh, and the Army today uh, is vastly different from the Army that, that I graduated from West Point into. Yeah, I think there's a lot of differences, but there's not everything is different, right? There's still expectations. And this was 2001. We got married. Um, he gave me that book. They keep updating it. And so they actually have it now and they update it. I remember there's a whole chapter on like forks, not forks, but place settings. And there was just like a whole chapter on this. Um, some of the tips were really helpful, like how to remember somebody's name, things like that. But what I experienced really was more of a, um, you're kind of supposed to know without being told that you have certain responsibilities, exactly. which, which to me is strange coming up from, from a purely civilian background. Like if my husband was a senior manager at Walmart, there wouldn't be an expectation that there, there would be anything attached to that, right? Other than probably a Christmas party every year or something like that. And the uh, earth-changing uh, difference in the uh, army of then and to the army of today is the working spouse. Uh, we had very few uh, working spouses. And so here you're talking about responsibilities of a spouse, uh, and they'd increase, of course, uh, we'll, we will next delve into uh, the commander's wife role. Uh, but even just as a, as a military spouse, you do have, as you said, some responsibilities. Uh, at the same time, you're probably holding down a job for a dual income uh, military family. I think that's particularly true for enlisted um, folks. Now, when I, when I moved there, I decided to go to graduate school. I was going to school full time and I was working on the side, doing some personal training, what I was doing before. Um, but yeah, you're right. I, I, I was in a, you know, this was 20 years ago now, okay, which is hard to believe, but it was still, you know, particularly a major Lieutenant Colonel colonels, most of those spouses weren't working outside of doing like pampered chef and, you know, the kind of um, makeup things, things that they can do really easily on the side, raise the kids. And it's really difficult, at least back then, before there were a lot of virtual options to work, you know, particularly with all the deployments, they, they were gone a lot. And so trying to bounce a full-time career um, while that was happening was, was really challenging. So let's fast forward. Uh, tell me about the transition to Fort Bragg. Yeah, so we actually did a long time at Fort Sill, five years. He did several deployments there. And then he got his battalion command at Fort Bragg uh, in North Carolina. And um, it was 06 to 08 during the surge. So it was uh, a really high op tempo. Uh, we were 18th Airborne Corps, which has 82nd and, and all of those assets in it. And we were lucky in that the, um, the assignment that our, his battalion had was actually artillery. They were rotating batteries um, in and out of Afghanistan, and they were actually getting to do their jobs, whereas a lot, even our brigade, other battalions were having to do the, you know, traffic stop things, the things that, you know, weren't, weren't related to artillery. So I think that was helpful for unit cohesion. So Reese is the commander of the battalion. Yeah, Reese is the battalion commander. And what was the strength of personnel? 
was the size of that battalion. Oh, geez. It was probably like, I don't know, 600 or so, 500, and 600, about 1,000 family members. A guess as to how many were married? About half. So at, at any rate, you have hundreds of families that uh, say goodbye to their spouses uh, a couple of times a year, maybe, or yeah. whatever. Uh, and what is your, what was your expectation, the expectations of you as the commander's wife? I remember going to that pre-command course that they had. Uh, they, they took us out to, I guess it was Leavenworth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they have a week where the spouses attend. Um, and there's an expectation you will attend. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, they, they were telling us basically what we were supposed to do. And, and I remember asking, I was like, so I'm supposed to take care of like a thousand families with four volunteers who are in their twenties and no money. Is that what we're doing here? And they're like, yeah, pretty much. And I'm thinking to myself, well, that's nuts. That's crazy. That can't work. So yeah. what was the actual experience at Bragg during a typical deployment? At that point, um, most people were, were on their second or third deployment. So I think the repeated deployments was something that I'm not sure anybody thought of. Um, and these were army deployments. They were a year, 15 months. That doesn't include the training up, all that kind of stuff. Because what people don't realize is just because they're not deployed doesn't mean they're not in the field, particularly combat arms. So even when they're home, you know, they're out in the field. For oh, a there's a whole the cycle of pre-deployment, uh, the deployment itself, and then post-deployment and uh, regrouping, retraining. Yeah, everybody talks about that, that, that you know, recouping. I don't know where the heck that was because we never felt that. You got 30 days block leave and then you were back at it in the field. So I think that was one of the challenges. It's just the operational temple uh, for the amount of people we had in the military was um, too high. You know, and that was the, you know, the people going over were doing their jobs, but that absolutely had an impact on the families. And what I saw close up were particularly the impacts on the spouses and the children, um, mental health issues. We had spouses that had suicidal ideations that had attempts. We had kids that needed really significant mental health and we couldn't get appointments for six months. Um, so that I really saw it from a, a mental health point of view. Um, that, that people were falling apart. And that, again, was just from the spouse and child side, much less the, uh, the soldier side. Now, other than uh, some of the more senior, perhaps officers uh, in the battalion, you're in your 30s, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and I imagine a lot of the spouses are early 20s, mm -hmm. maybe even some that are still teenagers. Yeah. Yeah, there was. So they look at you as a mother figure. <laughs> I don't know the mother figure, but they. It's funny because they. It's a weird situation where the only reason I'm in this position, which wasn't really a position, it was a volunteer. No one's getting paid for this, um, is because I was married to this guy, which you know there were some women who didn't want to do it, and good for them because it's not really their responsibility. So this was the whole kind of conversation that that, you know, that we were having back then is saying, listen, we, we need to professionalize. We need to put social workers in the unit. The, this, this day of spouses being able to care for other spouses might've worked in the first deployment, but deployment three, four, five, six, everybody's tired. You know, people are just kind of trying to take care of their own families. And so that was kind of my whole, Hey, we, we really need to look at this um, more strategically and add assets to it. So if, if you're saying that, you know, our, our, um, we're combat harms. So our husbands were able to be responsible for millions of dollars of equipments in people's lives. You know, we couldn't get $10,000 a year for the battalion for families. Right. So that was a big uphill battle because there was this thought like, you know, families should just be doing this because they should be doing it. You had some opportunities, uh, to, discuss these problems with uh, more senior people, probably both at Bragg and, and maybe even beyond that. Uh, it, I will confess to everybody here that I was one of the first to under, understand that Chris, Christy is not bashful. <laughs> she is uh, very outspoken and speaks her mind uh, respectfully, I will say that. Uh, but uh, tell me about some of the commander's meetings or whatnot where you had the opportunity to ask for some help, I'll put it that way. Yeah, so I think initially it was all the spouses. I wasn't the only one who was seeing this, mm -hmm. right? I think the difference was because I came into it later, 
I, you know, had some experience before that I felt okay saying it, you know, beyond just our little wives group. I was told the army, this was a readiness and retention issue. It had nothing to do with what's being nice, right? Because you have to tie it directly to mission, right? And so we were able to see data in our unit of having to bring soldiers home because the families imploded, because I, as a volunteer, couldn't do anything about it and have the resources to do it. Um, so I think approaching it that way was helpful of just saying, listen, this isn't about altruism. It's not about, you know, being a social service agency. It's about what we need to do to ensure that the troops, when they're over there, um, can do their jobs. Um, I tried to go through the kind of the ways they have for wives to, to get issues up the chain. I think the challenge I have with that is those issues tend to be, you know, uh, very specific, like a school issue or a pothole issue or something, you know, something that's can they can fix. These were systemic institutional changes that needed to be made, right? Like we were talking about putting resources into um, military family life consultants, which they did a couple of years later. I think I was just a little ahead of the curve there because they did start doing these things. They realized it was good for the mission to do it. But I think when <clears throat> when I was saying these things, it was kind of some people took them as, you know, well, what's going on with 327? Why can't they take care of their people? And no, none of us could. And so when I stood up and I said, look, we just got voted the best family readiness group in this uh, at Fort Bragg. And let me tell you what's going on in our battalion. We had three wives and trying to kill you, themselves. Who were you saying this to? Well, I tried to say it lots of times, yeah. but when I finally, when I was hitting walls and nobody was pushing it forward, um, uh, General Casey came down, um, he just chief, made, of, staff chief of staff of the, of the army, and we were asked to come in to hear him speak. And then he asked us what was going on. And, you know, I was sitting on my hands waiting for someone else to say it and nobody was going to say it. And so I just stood up and said, you know, these family writing groups were never meant to do what they're doing now. And, you know, this is, this is what's going on and this is what we need help with or whatever. So that was the first time I kind of gone quote unquote outside the chain. And I remember <laughs> there was a senior wife who was very nice, who said to me, um, you know, Christy, you, you have to stay within your chain of command. And I was like, ma'am, due respect. I'm a civilian. I don't have a chain of command. And when I tried to stay in my husband's chain of command, it just went nowhere. And this was too important, right? So this goes back to, you know, why I felt like this was so important. Here I'm coming from this kind of upper middle class, you know, situation, introduced to the military, to these amazing people, like I never would have known otherwise, who just, I can't believe the stuff that they can do with so little for so long with four kids and all, I mean, it's amazing. And so I felt, um, pretty angry that, that we weren't doing better by these families when we have so much in the United States and we have so many resources. And that a lot of times when I was saying, Hey, can we pull from outside the gates? You know, the, the response I was getting from some senior leadership is, well, we don't want to make it look like we can't take care of our own. Right. And, and I'm thinking, what are we not American? And by the way, the cat's out of the bag. Look at the suicide numbers. We weren't taking care of our own. You, you mentioned earlier uh, troops being brought home because of severe family problems. So uh, that translates directly into readiness. That's right. Yep, that's right. And, and, that's, and that's what the Army should care about. I never expected the Army to be, quote unquote, nice. I mean, it's an institution. It's, it's supposed to, you know, protect the country, win wars. I got it, you know. But, you know, if you are going to commit your military to... 15 years of war with less than 1% of the population, there's a price to pay for that. So if we are not, if we as a country and you got, we, we have discussed it, has decided to outsource our national defense to such a small population, then we bet we better give them what they need um, when they're going through it and when they come home. One thing that's not changed probably from uh, the first uh, 1800s army to the current army is that I think leaders everywhere understand people <clears throat> are our most important resource. Uh, and it, without the people, there is no army. I think, yes. And I think that we got a lot of lip service to that. Uh, but I think that that, that expectation of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, wives should do this kind of thing is very strong.
I mean, there were all kinds of memos. And I remember the army decided to capitalize the F in families, like they capitalized the S in soldiers to show respect. And that went over like a ton of bricks for families. I'm like, okay, you're going to capitalize families, but we still can't get social workers in the unit. So, I mean, I think the army does have a tendency to kind of say those things, but the actual implementation was um, short. I want to tread very lightly here, but uh, you end up back in Washington, DC uh, and the marriage was suffering. Yeah, so we came up here, he left command in 08 and we came up here in the summer. He got stationed at HRC, which was in Alexandria at the time. <laughs> and um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I get asked, I, I get asked quite often if, if the wars ended our marriage and I answer that as honestly as I can, which is that's the only marriage I ever knew. And so many other families never, I, I never had any perspective of what a, a marriage was without all these deployments and what that comes with it. Um, and so, yeah, we were struggling uh, and, um, and I was struggling to figure out, okay, what do I do now? Right. I mean, I had gone to graduate school for journalism, so I was doing a little bit of writing uh, and, but I, I had this sense of unfinished business because everything I had done at battalion level, I mean, I, for two years, I put my heart and soul into trying to make sure that the families in our unit had what they needed. And I did a lot, but it was just a drop in the bucket because the system was so broken. And when I had, uh, uh, talked to general Casey, there was blowback from that blowback to my husband. Uh, and Girl, so can't you control your, wife. yeah, I mean, verbatim. His brigade commander says, get control over your wife. Now, I'm not a jerk. I didn't just stand up in front of the, you know, uh, chief staff of the army and say these things. For two years, I had tried every meeting. I wrote memos. I did the whole thing. But, you know, if you're sitting there and you have an opportunity to, to basically try to save people. Alan, people in our unit were dying. People taking their own lives. And I just, I, I couldn't live with that. And when we moved up here, you know, I was like, well, is there a way I can, you know, call more attention to this issue? And then I ended up meeting Tom Ricks, who wrote a couple of books. I was going to ask about that next. Yeah. So Tom Ricks, I met I, <clears throat> at a, a reporter for the Washington Post at the time, I believe. Yeah, I, I think I'm not sure he was still there, but he had been and he wrote a couple of books. There. And um, but he knew them at the Washington Post. And he said, you know, you should write something. And I did. And and uh, and that was uh, an op-ed that was published in 2009. Army families under fire. Army families under fire. Yep. And what was the immediate reaction to that? Uh, my immediate reaction was to duck. <laughs> <laughs> and Reese and I had this, and we were still married at the time, and we had this conversation like, what is this going to mean? It's one thing to risk your own skin, career, but this was risking my husband's. And it's a career. <laughs> it's a career. And he was up for his 06 Colonel board when it published. So it was a serious conversation that we had. And, you know, obviously he, I didn't need permission. I was going to do what I was going to do, but we had a long conversation about how that might impact him. And, you know, basically we thought, and Tom said the same thing that he, we were actually safer going public because I was just kind of privately ticking people off at the, at the installation level. And my husband had top blocks as a battalion commander. So it didn't make sense for him not to be promoted to Colonel. So we figured, you know, it, it would be safe for him, but mostly I figured I have to say something. I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to be like, you know, 90 in a rocking chair thinking I should have done something here, but I had no idea what that was going to look like. I mean, it, it was one of the reasons it resonated. I think it was because it was right before social media took off. So there wasn't, now everybody has a voice, right? Blogs, social media, Facebook. Back then, having a wife, having the featured op-ed in the Washington Post, it was kind of the first time a wife had really gone outside the lines. Um, and, uh, and I remember I got like a thousand emails from folks, the majority of whom were saying thanks for taking the risk and having the courage to, to write this. There was a few people that pushed back on me, um, but none of them disagreed with what I said. They just said I shouldn't have said it in the Washington Post. Like we should try to take care of this in-house type of thing, which obviously I had tried. So yeah, that the reaction to that really was, um, who the heck is this girl, right? I wasn't with an organization and I remember I was getting pulled every way and I was going to Congress. I met with the Secretary of Defense and the President and his wife. And you know, it was very overwhelming. 
Um, but uh, I, I knew that there was had to be something more than the op-ed, right? Because once I wrote it, I was like, well, is that it? Is that my only job here? Um, and that's when I put my head down for a couple of years to really understand the bigger picture. Because I knew what I knew. I was right about what I said. You read the op-ed, it still stands. But I didn't understand the larger, like, kind of ecosystem. Uh, today, uh, do you think it had an impact, uh, a positive impact <coughs> in terms of change? I don't know. People say it did. Uh, I, I think I think it helped along with lots of other things, move the ball forward. You know, some of the things I said in there, you know, like we're baking cookies and selling to our own husbands in the motor pool, that's still happening, right? The fact that we still haven't figured out a way to fund family support without basically cannibalizing the people that we're, you know, that we're raising the money for. Um, but I do think one of the things that has happened is that that the our government agencies, DOD and VA, have opened the doors a little bit. They're not as resistant to outside organizations um, helping. So I think it might have helped in that respect. At this point, I will remind our audience that uh, we started this podcast for, with Percota Support Foundation, partly is uh, one way to mark the 10th anniversary of the Coda Support Foundation. I mentioned that here because uh, now we're up to that era about 10 years ago when my West Point classmate, Bill Serchak, a good friend, uh, uh, and I also became, my wife and I were friendly with his daughter, Bridget Serchak, uh, and she turned out to be a, a good friend of yours. Hmm. And she uh, decided that she should make an introduction. Uh, and I think the one of the reasons for that in the back of her mind was because uh, I and a, and a group of fellow retired, mostly general officers, uh, had created uh, something called the Code of Support for our troops, uh, which was meant to be a parallel to the Code of Conduct that our troops uh, all are guided by. And uh, the whole point of, of this was that fewer than 1%, as you mentioned, of our uh, population today serve in the military, and they have in the first article of their uh, code of conduct, a pledge that they're prepared to give their life in defense of our freedom, a very profound commitment. And the code of support that I and my fellow, fellow uh, art writers of this uh, was intended to be a counterpart for the other 99% to kind of codify some of the things that we could do for the 1% in return for that commitment. Uh, so that had been launched uh, unofficially on the web just as a uh, basically a awareness uh, mission to make the general public more aware of what service and sacrifice are all about. So with that as background, uh, Bridget was aware of this and she decided that you and I should meet and we met. Uh, and long story short there, uh, you mentioned earlier that you were an individual and had no platform and that came up in the discussion. Uh, and so uh, my plans for a foundation that would only uh, advocate and educate uh, based upon the code of support uh, suddenly opened up to greater possibilities. Uh, we brought Christy on board and you became my co-founder uh, to shape this foundation to do all it could be. Uh, now, to reconnect with the story we've been weaving here, uh, you were no longer at Fort Bragg, but you were still connected with a lot of folks that you had met in that experience as army wives everywhere, always connected with folks that they've met before. And, uh, some of them began to give you phone calls, is that right? Yeah, two o'clock in the morning, crisis, baby on the hip, husband with PTSD. You know, it, it was um, it was the impact of war. Uh, and, you know, I know for, for me, every time Reese came back from a deployment, he came back a little differently. Uh, and so, you know, they were looking for help. And um, I was trying to help them with what I knew. Is it because of your uh, role as the commander's wife before that those connections were 
uh, they decided to reach out uh, to you or did the op-ed have anything? I think both. I was getting emails from people I didn't know. I was getting a lot of referrals. Um, you know, people, people saw the splash the op-ed made. And so I think they saw it as like, hey, she must have connections type of thing. Um, but that's really, the, you know, the, that experience of, of understanding that people just didn't know what to do or where to go and what resources were out there when, when you and I met. Um, that's really what kind of started the whole case coordination program that we had because we need we need a program to well, address this. Uh, we knew at that time that there were some 40,000 purported organizations, nonprofits that had troop support, military family, something like that in their mission statements. Uh, concurrently, Pew Research did a study. We were then 10 years into uh, the war on terror. And Pew Research did a study which concluded that uh, of the current war veterans, uh, about 70% were doing pretty well, being able to transition back out of the military into civilian life, might hit a bump or two in the road, but uh, uh, they, were, they were under control and proceeding with their lives. Fully 30%, they concluded, were having some significant problems. Now, at this time, we're looking at those, you and I are looking at those uh, 40,000 organizations and say, well, we want to be 40,001. With all of those organizations out there, plus the billions that the VA is spending and the DOD is spending a lot on and Department mm -hmm. of Labor is spending a lot on helping these, these veterans, why were all, there so severe problems happening? I think it's fair to say we came to the conclusion that the problem was not resources, it was access to those resources. Making the connection between the person, the family with the problem, and the right resource for them to solve the problem. Resources, yeah. right? I think that's the other thing is that, you know, what we've discovered, I mean, everybody knows people don't come in pretty boxes, right? There's usually not just one problem, um, you know? So if someone has um, undiagnosed or untreated mental health issues or traumatic brain injury or whatever it is, that's going to lead to problems with family stability, employment, you know, lots of things. And so, I think what happened was, unfortunately, it wasn't until General Corelli kind of really put a focus uh, in, in like 2008, 2009 on traumatic brain injury and PTS is that we really started to screen for that. So you had a whole bunch of people who were dealing with that before um, that was really recognized that got out or were pushed out with other than honorable discharges for behavioral issues that were attached to those untreated mental health issues. And those folks really got lost in the shuffle. We're, and we're seeing that now. We're seeing a trend in the people who kind of fell through the cracks early on um, and didn't get connected to resources. You've had <laughs> an opportunity to be an advocate uh, for bad paper, as it's called, and, yeah. and make, getting a relook at those for a lot of military folks. Yeah, getting, you know, relooking at discharge status. I mean, you, you got a situation where, you know, veterans who need it most aren't getting the, enough access to the VA or even a non, some nonprofits who only do honorable um, discharges. But, you know, again, I, I you look at this as a, as a public health crisis, right? Now, granted, there are, what about 18 to 20 million veterans in the United States right now? Um, we still think about 70% of them are doing fine, but 30% of 20 million is, you know, and that doesn't include the family members. So we're talking about, you know, good 10 million people. Well, even if you just confine that 30% to the current war veterans, that's uh, maybe three, bit, three million or something right. like that. Still a very large number. And, you, you know, to it, one of the things we promised each other was that we weren't going to let what happened to your generation happen to mine, your Vietnam veterans. And a lot of the folks we work with are in that category. We, we said from the beginning that we didn't want to be a nonprofit for just post 9-11, because the way that your generation of veterans were treated when they got back was disgusting. So we wanted to make sure that we were working with those folks too. And we have some great success stories of people who weren't even enrolled in the VA and who were homeless that we were able to kind of re-engage and get back into society and get them the help that they needed. So very briefly, uh, what Code of Support has evolved into uh, based on that early experience is, <clears throat> is case coordination. And you were our first case coordinator. 
uh, you want to give a 30 second capsule of what our case coordination is all about? Yeah, basically we become that one point of contact. So instead of a family trying to figure out even what their problems are, they, they usually know what one problem is like they're about to be evicted or they're about to lose their car. That's the thing that usually drives people to help initially. But what we do is we peel back that onion and we discover what are the things that are factoring into this crisis state. And those are multiple mental health, employment, family unrest, all those things. And each one of those things has to be addressed. And so we are responsible for finding those things, pulling them in, setting them up for the families. We, we actually talk to each organization. We make sure they have a bed. You know, we do really deep case management. I think at least half of the value of what we add is we're actually listening to people. I think just having a, someone listen to your story, not try to get you off the phone, not try to stick you to another organization. Um, I think that that's one of the things that makes us really different. And uh, the, the secret sauce behind our ability to do that has been a knowledge of the organizations that are out there, uh, which evolved into uh, a database that we call Patriot Link, patriotlink.org today, which catalogs the thousands of resources that are available from nonprofits at no cost to veterans. Uh, and the, I look at that as uh, that's a resource that the 70% who do pretty well on their own, but just need a little help here and there can tap into on their own. And it's uh, the first step in self-help. Yeah, I think there are three kind of groups. I mean, Patriot Link is valuable to anybody connected to the military veteran space, be it children, spouses, caregivers, active duty or whatever. But there's the, as you mentioned, the 70% that might be looking for a scholarship for their kid or um, employment training, things like that. There's um, the 30% that really need more hands-on help, like case management. And then there's that population that work with that 30%. So our case managers, that's what drove the development of Patriot Link is that our case managers needed a system by which to find things. And that's true for social workers in the VA, right? Case managers out in the field, all the faith-based charities. So that's, you know, we think with Patriot Link and being able to scale it across the country and give people access to this free resource that then everybody can do some level of coordination. We understand that not every organization is gonna do case management, but at least if someone calls them Instead of saying, no, I'm sorry, we can't help. It's hold on a second. Let me tell you who you can talk to and give you three good organizations that you actually qualify for. Um, so I think we can, it can make a big difference in terms of how people access resources in the space. Um, now it's one thing to start an organization that we've, as we've done. Uh, and today we're up to close to 15 employees, I guess, doing uh, the various programs that we have. Uh, it's another thing to develop a culture, a culture of service uh, that makes sure that we hire the right people and that they perform the way they need to perform to successfully do our job. That's largely your responsibility as first the executive director and now as the CEO. <laughs> How do you go about doing that kind of thing? And, and how do, in just in training new employees today, how do we approach that? Well, you know, a couple of years ago, we were smart enough to hire Court Ogilvie as the chief operations officer. And he really has put a lot of rigor around the hiring process. We didn't have as much, you know, kind of discipline behind that. But as to your point of culture, um, I, I, there's, you know, you build an organization with the spirit that you start the organization, right? So of service, of leaning forward, of, you know, we, we are probably less risk adverse than a lot of nonprofits. We take chances. We developed a technology platform for goodness sake. I mean, that is not something that most veteran serving organizations are going to get into. So when we're looking for um, individuals to join the team, you know, we're looking for somebody that will fit into that, that culture of, service of getting it done no matter what um and and it's not a nine to five job no and i i think that you know particularly for our case managers who are all either caregivers of veterans or veterans themselves one of the things that makes them so effective at their job is they have walked that path right it's it's you know they know what it's like they know what it feels like and so it's not just we're helping people get connected to resources, they're able to really connect with folks like, yeah, I've gone through that. 
And so I think that makes a big difference in your ability to communicate with, um, with the community um, in, in, a, in a way that resonates more. All right. Well, Christy, we could go on and on talking about Code of Support Foundation. That's not our uh, purpose today. Uh, and I think it's that we can wrap this up. Uh, your service uh, started as service as a military spouse, member of a military family, uh, discounting other things that may have gone on be before you got involved with the military. Uh, then as a commander's wife, uh, and most recently as the CEO of Code of Support Foundation. Uh, and now you're responsible for uh, millions of, of soldiers and sailors and Marines and airmen out there, the veterans, uh, and not just the veterans, the active duty as well. And uh, I think you've come on, on a long journey. Uh, you probably have a, a greater journey to still find your uh, full destiny out there. But I want to thank you for your service, not just to Code of Support, but to the Army, to the Air Force, to the Navy, to the Marines, to the Coast Guard, to all those veterans out there. Uh, thank you for what you do. And thank you for your service to the country. Thank you, Alan. And thanks for, for partnering with me 10 years ago and helping build this thing, because it's one thing to want to serve. It's another thing to actually have the platform to do that. And I think that you and I together have built something that that will outlast us both. And that to me is is really special. So we'll wrap it up today and say thank you for uh, watching or listening to our podcast. And we hope you'll join us on our next journey as a profile in service to our nation. Thank you very much. This podcast is powered by and copyright of the Coda Support Foundation. Coda Support Presents Profiles and Service is hosted by Major General Alan B. Salisbury and produced by Carly Van Tassel. The opinions of the guests on the show do not directly reflect the stance of the Coda Support Foundation. To learn more about Coda Support, please visit www.codasupport.org or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Finally, if you or someone you know is a service member, veteran, caregiver, or military family member in need of assistance, please visit codasupport.org slash get help or create a free account at patriotlink.org.